Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. How are you doing this Saturday afternoon, evening in some coast? I'm Sherrard, and um, I hope your Saturday is going well. Today, we have a very special show. I have a legend on the show, and today's uh, topic we're going to be talking about is when legends speak, you better listen. Uh, the Sherrard Show is brought to you by Evolt. Evolt is the revolutionary way of losing weight, all natural. All you have to do is just take one pill a day and it allows you to lose 20 to 30 pounds in about 90 days. You can see on your monitor eboat.tv or eboat TV to get yours today. It's all natural. And just let them know the Sherrard Show sent you or you can put Sherrard as your code and get 20% off your first purchase. You know, ladies and gentlemen, here at the Sherrard Show, oftentimes we have some big name guests to stop by the show. But this particular individual has been in the industry for many, many years. He's worked with people like Martha Reeves, Randy Crawford, Quincy Jones, Herbie Hancock, B.B. King, Albert King, Royce, uh, Rose Royce, as well as Elkie Brooks. And then he also was the drummer, um, singer, and songwriter for many hits you hear today. I'm so proud to have him on the show at Living Legend, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. James Gadsden is on the Sherrard Show. How are you this evening, sir? Oh, thank you so much. I'm doing fine this evening. Well, it's a great to have you on. You know, um, oftentimes we have people who've done big things on the show, but when it comes to people like you, you have to stop and pause and just praise you for your, what you've done in the industry. Tell us a little bit about how you got started, Mr. Gatson. Well, my father was a, a musician. I heard music when I was very small, um, but he really didn't want me to be in the music business. You know, I, when I got to be... I guess about 12 or 13, I became a doo whopper. I uh, did not really care for playing the drums at that time. In fact, I didn't start playing drums professionally or period until I was 21 years old. You know, uh, I was, I think, you know, I was a doo whopper and I thought that I was going to make it, you know, in that field. And here came Frankie Lyman. And so <laughs> that's still my, you know. Put a lot of people out of business, huh? <laughs> yeah, as far as I was concerned, I mean, I was floored, you know, so, uh, but, uh, you know, I was, I still, uh, you know, kept singing and I went into the Air Force and when I got out, my brother had a band. I didn't even know he had, he had learned how to play guitar. So the four years I was in there, he had learned how to play guitar and, and he had acquired a, a working band. So he invited me to join the band, which I did at that time. I wasn't playing drums. I could play a little keyboards, piano, and uh, you know, I was front line, man. I'd dance and sing. During that time, little Richard and everybody was hot. So uh, I would do that type of thing. And uh, now, 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 Mr. Gatson, what time period was this? The 50s? What did you speaking about now? Uh, it was the late, yeah, the 50s. The 50s. Yeah, the 50s. Yeah. That was the 50s. And I, when I got out of the Air Force in six, 1961. Now, what was music like back in the 50s for Black people especially? Well, they called it rock and roll. Well, I mean, it's, you know, they, they have labeled it so... I mean, it was great music, I, I think. I mean, uh, a lot of people are using the same songs the day that they did then. Uh, technology has stepped in and it's changed a lot of it but uh i mean you had to really be, i mean if you was a if you were a singer you had to really know how to sing it wasn't but people get away with a lot of things today you can't you, you couldn't so, do that back then so you couldn't hide behind the synthesizer and everything in the studio back oh then. no and the uh they have the they can t you know tune you uh tune you up with the technology they have that they have today which is great i think but then they didn't have that, so you had to really be able to sing, you know. But you know one thing that's interesting, James, is that some of the greatest singers um, started off as drummers, such as like David Ruffin, Marvin Gaye. They were drummers, but then they got their shot to be singers, and they realized their talent transcend just working as an instrument, uh, in an instrumentation, or behind a piano or behind a drum. That's kind of like with you, because you're also a singer and a songwriter as well. Is that correct? Correct. Well, I had some miss uh, fortunes, you know, that's why I didn't come out from behind the drums, <laughs> you know, 
Now, when you speak uh, of misfortunes, what do you mean in terms of? Well, I was I was in a, a group, and uh, I sang a song that became a big hit record, and the pe a lot of people didn't know it was me, and the guy the leader of the group didn't want them to know it was me, and uh, it was just rough. You know, when I joined this group, I told him, I said, hey, man, I have to, I got to sing if I'm going to be in your group. Oh, it's so, come on, sing. But then he didn't really want me to sing. So it blocked a lot of uh, opportunities that I had as far as me coming out from the drums. And uh, it affected me so bad, I almost had a nervous breakdown. Oh, wow. Because I was, because I was really, I was really more of a singer than I was a drummer. So, uh, when I finally, you know, I reverted all my attention to the drums and I, I left that band and I, Bill Withers, I left the Watson Hunter Thirsty Man. I joined Bill Withers. I played with him, I, you know, and I left that band and I, I started working in the recording studios. And uh, when I first got there, Motown was here and Motown was a very famous record company, a big record company. And uh, they, you know, they would call me to do sessions because they would, man, you know, we don't really, I didn't really want you as no drummer. I want to produce you. I had got, been so despondent behind what had happened to me uh, that I didn't even want to sing anymore. So I just reverted myself to playing the drums. And I was very blessed to be able to do that because, I mean, they got some famous, they had all these famous musicians. I had the famous drummer. So. I applied myself and by the grace of God, I was able to, uh, you know, play on a lot of records. I've been on 500 gold records, you know, so that's- And, and, that's, and, and that's, that's very congratulatory. And we'll talk about that momentarily, but let's talk more about, um, if you don't mind, about the, the, your getting kind of messed up because you weren't able to get the um, publicity that you deserved singing on a hit song. Now, my question to you, James, is that why did this individual not want you to, uh, shine and be able to ultimately get your royalties. Well, he wanted to be, he wanted to shine. He wanted to be the only one to shine. It was just, you know, just that way, you know. Um, I would have never, you know, joined this group because he told me, he said, oh man, you can sing. You know, and then he told me, he said, well, man, you know, I mean, you can make a million dollars, man, if you don't sing, man, you don't, if you just don't sing, man. I did said, did, well, you, man, did I you make a million dollars? Huh? Did you make a million dollars by not singing? No, <laughs> no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. But I guess that he, he just didn't want me to, you know, he wanted to be the cat. And so I eventually left, you know, on a high note because the, at the, the group had, uh, you know, they had a couple of hit records. So, you know, I left on a high note, you know, I just left. You know, not and, and, and so from there do. on, so there on, uh, James, you went back to, to playing the drums, you said? Right. I just started playing drums and uh, I was hoarse for two years after I left that group. I mean, what would happen, uh, the individual would bring in songs for me to sing and uh, they would be too high for me. And uh, then it, the individual spoke to me about it. He said, well, hey man, everything that you, anything that you write, I have to have uh, half the writers and all the publishing. Well, that's where all the money is. So that's kind of stunted my writing. I didn't want to, you know, hey, in my mind, hey, why should I write anything else if I'm not gonna really get, uh, you know, the benefits of it and, uh, you know, it was kind of strange. I, I, I just, I, I was able to, I finally pulled out of it. I, I couldn't, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't. Now, now James, um, your career, however, um, having some downfalls to it, and believe you me, that was very traumatic to be able to sing in a hit song and not see the fruits of your labor. But you appear to have had a very successful career, at least working with Bill Withers. And then also working with Martha Reeves and Randy Crawford, even Quincy Jones, iconic Quincy Jones, and doing big, big things. And then even being a part of Diana Ross's hit song, Love Hangover, and working with Paul McCartney. So it looks like your career really rebounded, even with that misfortune. Is that correct? It did. 
it really it really did rebound as a drummer and i and i'm thankful to that all praises to god almighty you know uh and so i was able to uh put the singing on the back burner as bad as i wanted to be that as bad as i wanted to be a singer i was able to put that on the back burner though and uh, concentrate on you know drumming you know one thing that's i had some when i was playing with bill wiggers i had pardon me i'm sorry it's a bit of a delay but go ahead with your thought james you know, when i was playing with bill withers I, it was I, I i was on a small label and uh i put out a couple of records and uh you know nothing happened you know when the people hear them when they hear them the day online they wondered why they weren't hits but i guess the company i don't know what happened i guess the company didn't have the but or they didn't push it for one reason or another you know so uh you know i uh I said, well, hey, you know what? I'll, I'll just, I won't, I won't deal with this no more. I'll just concentrate on drumming, and that's what I did. And uh, you know, Bill Withers was very successful. I mean, I didn't do any, I didn't play on "Ain't No Sunshine," but I played on the, the other ones that were big. You know, wow, use wow. me and lean on me and and uh, kiss him out. Those that's yeah. some big stuff. That's some very big and, stuff. And uh, I was able to. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was told that, uh, you know, every, you know, I understand, you know, we as artists are very, uh, I don't, I don't know, know what word to use for it, but we have, uh, we have our days. So I was told that, uh, hey, man, everything you play got those GD 16 notes in it. I was famous for playing the 16 notes on the drum. Uh, and so I said, you know, I better try to find something else because I can feel the tension that's not going to be, uh, it ain't going to be happening no more. So I was blessed to go to Motown. Now, Motown, I had to change my whole style when I played with Motown. I, I couldn't play the style that I played with Bill Willis. I had to Why change my that? whole style. Well, I mean, Motown had a different program you know they had a different thing you know i mean the closest i played to the bill was stuff was a i played the first hit i played on motown was called do it baby it was with the miracles at smoke had left and they had the new lead singer and that was close as i played to the 16 notes you know what i'm saying <laughs> uh but uh you know they had a they had their way of doing things the way that, i mean i now I learned a lot at Motown. That was a great, great school for me as far as my career, my career enhancement as far as playing back behind on a lot of those different artists and a lot of, you know, being blessed to play on a lot of gold records. I did learn a lot, but I had to change my style. I could, I still, I, I could still play the style that I played with Bill, but the style, the stuff that I played with Motown was quite different. You know, now, what was one of the biggest but names I was you able played to be with? Blessed to be able to play it. What was one of the biggest names you played with in Motown? Well, the biggest over there, I guess, Donald Ross, The Temptations, uh, The Jackson Five, they call it that time. You know, Dancing Machine was a big one. Uh, wow, that I can remember of. Uh, <laughs> so, man, a lot. It was so, so many records that I played on over there. So it's, it's absolutely safe to say you've rebounded really nicely in, in, in the midst of the early career setback. But what is the, how do you, what's your perspective now, Mr. Gadsden, on music, um, the era of music? Because, you know, with the Motown sound and the doo-wop, which I absolutely love the doo-wop and Motown sound, I think it's timeless. But what do you, how do you look at music today? Well, you know, music is, is music. And we have different people have different, uh, ideas musically uh the music changed because a lot you know technology had a lot to do with the change of the music i mean some of it i like some of it i don't but that's everybody you know uh and you have to respect that if you're going to be in the music business you know technology uh did uh you know it really took over as far as the music uh, you know that's happening today and um, so we all had to get 
technical in a way of speaking. I had to learn other things besides playing drums. Such as what? And, uh, huh? Well, I had to learn how to play, you know, the keyboards and operate the computer, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, and uh, it was just, you know, which was cool. I mean, because it's, you know, it's a different, you know, raises your level. Uh, I don't, you know, so it's, you know, it was different than just coming in and looking at the music and and playing a session, which I still love to do. Every so often we get, we still get to do that, to play live. A lot of times, I mean, especially since this coronavirus, I don't go anywhere because I have a COPD and asthma, but people will send stuff to me. I have a, I'm sitting in my studio now. I have a studio and they can send me the music and I can play it and send it back to them. See, you know, I'm looking, in, heard of. I'm looking at your yeah. background. Is those some eight tracks in the background you got there, James? Oh, that's the 16 track. It's the old 16 track machine that I bought from Smokey Robinson. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, wow. That's, tell, you know, tell, everybody, have... tell everybody what a 16 track machine is. Well, that's 16 uh, different, you can record on 16 different tracks as they would call it. They first started off with two, well, I, I mean, they, going way back, they had a spool that they started with. But I think Motown was cutting on two, three, and maybe four tracks. Uh, and so they had to really, uh, you know, it was a lot of different techniques and imagination that they had. To, the, the music sounded wonderful, though. I mean, if you listen to the early Motown stuff, it sounds great. So by them, you know, they kept that technology, they kept making tracks. This was 16, but they had 24 tracks. Then they had 48 tracks at one time, you know. Um, so it was that going that way. And then technology stepped in where they have, what we have a digital situation now, which they people using Pro Tools and uh, all just different uh, software in order to make music. And uh, I do a lot of that. You know, I do a lot of that. And uh, it's, it's one, you know, it's cool. It's all music. It's beautiful music, as a matter of fact. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking to the, the iconic James Gadsden. He is a celebrity drummer, musician, been in the industry for many, many years, worked with some of the biggest names in the industry. He actually was on a Temptations album, Bill Withers, uh, Diana Ross. He's worked with even B.B. King. Um, but one thing he told me that's very interesting off camera, we're going to talk about it right now, is he once sat at the table with the mythical iconic Sam Cook. Let's talk about Man, that. That was a beautiful thing for me. I was a very young gentleman at that age and I was working with a gentleman who was the one that originated the twist, who wrote the twist that Shelby Checker got famous on. The guy's name was Hank Ballard. They had a group called Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. In the 50s, they were biggest. I mean, they were risk more risque than Prince was. I mean, it was, they were, it was a big name. And so 15 years later, I'm working with them, you know, uh, and uh, Hank took a liking to me. He, in fact, he let me sing to open the show before they came out. And so uh, we had a big show in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And they had, I mean, they had, oh, man, Jerry Butler, Jimmy Reed. I mean, everybody that you could think of uh, was on the show at about 30 acts that night. And Sam Cooke was the, he was the, the, the uh, you know, the, the leading, the, gentleman that he hosted the show and so after uh, the show Hank Ballard had a mansion in Atlanta Georgia and he invited invited me to his home you know for dinner and there was Sam Cook man and so I got to sit at the table with Sam Cook and uh Hank Ballard and the valet stood up so I mean that was great because I, 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 I now, 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 now James did you say anything to Sam did you talk to him Oh yeah, we talked and he was very, very, he was very, he was real cool. Real, Sam was beautiful, beautiful individual. Uh, he was very, he was an, and he was an activist too. I mean, he was a very, he was serious about the blackness. You know, he was serious about that. I mean, he, he, he was, I never, I had never seen, he, I, I don't think he was scared of anything. I never seen, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was, very, he was a very brave man, relentless. 
he, but you know, right. James, he had to be in order to start his own publishing as well as record label where he owned his own publishing. You right. Know, you're talking about, you know, in the 60s when black people couldn't even own their own songs, let alone own your own publishing and your right. own label. And, and he had white people working for him then. I mean, Herb Albert and Herb Albert was worked for Sam Cooke. Herb Albert told me this, you know. So, I mean, he was he was quite a entrepreneur, you know. And, uh, you know, he was a one of a kind. Now, um, when you're with your career now, you have, I mean, we're looking at some of your hits right now. They're on the screen on Lean On Me that you played on Use Me, uh, Good Vibrations, uh, Dancing Machine, I Want You, Love Hangover, Go By What's In Your Heart. Um, I mean, these are very recognizable songs and a lot of them were, were even on played on movies. They were soundtracks for movies as well. Well, they, two of them that you named, I sang on Go By What's In Your Heart and Good Vibrations, you know. Uh, wow. And, uh, you know, they didn't really get the notoriety. I mean, people love them now. They hear them now on the line. They buy them, you know. But, uh, you know, it was, man, it, it, it's, I, I, I just feel blessed, and I know I am, to be able to play on other people's music. And for, and for it to become successful. Now, that's, that's very interesting. That's, that's interesting. that's interesting you say that, for example. Um, you can remind me, like, you know, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, for example. Um, people used to think that Harold Melvin was singing lead until they realized it was Teddy Pendergrass. Right. But Harold, Harold Melvin only sang about two songs. Um, that's true. The rest were just Harold Melvin. Um, I mean, the rest were just Teddy Pendergrass carrying the group. Right. But, I mean, uh, I didn't even know it. when we when we hear about Harold Melvin and the Blue Nose, I, I assumed that it was Harold Melvin. <laughs> Me too. But it what that was not the case. And so looking at you, um, you've sang on so many songs and I uh, played background on them as well. But have, do you feel like um, you've gotten your just due on a lot of these hit songs that you actually? Uh, well, I love to? land. I sang. That was the number two pop record. And a lot of people, a lot of people didn't know I was singing on it. They thought it was Charles Wright, you know. Wow. So I mean, so I understand uh, how a person would feel like that, you know. And, and, and live, they didn't even see me, so they didn't know I was singing nowhere because the horns would be in front of me, you know. So, uh, so what I know how that. Song, what about the song "Express Yourself"? Are you uh, singing on that as well? No, that's Charles Wright. That is that's Charles Wright. I'm I'm the drummer on that. You know, that was that was starting. That's when I had started experimenting and coming up with the, that type of a 16 note syncopated beat. The rhythms had changed, you know, a little bit. I changed the course of a lot of music. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, that what, express what, yourself was a different thing, you know. You know, one thing that's interesting, James, that I, I find this, um, like with the song Express Yourself, a lot of songs like from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, especially, um, certain songs were singing to a generation or singing to a cause. Express Yourself is one of them. Um, you a lot of Curtis Mayfield songs were singing to a time. Fred Man, is that dead, be um, so many. And then you turn around and look at um, um, Bobby Womack, you know, was singing a few songs that were off of the times. I, right. Do you think we need more songs that sing to the cause that we're going I am to do? So, so, I am so surprised. And I mean, with the music that's out there today and the, and the people that are out there today that are making the music, I am, I don't know why we're not hearing what's going on. I mean, everybody, I mean, you know, the blackness, you know, we, we shall overcome. Are we trying to move it on up? You know, we're a winner, uh, Curtis Mayfield, uh, you know, uh, I mean, just, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that it's not out there. I'm surprised that nobody's saying anything about it. That's correct. You know, um, where were you when you first heard a change is going to come? I was, I was still in Kansas City. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was, you know, when I was playing, when I met Sam Cooke and all that stuff, I was still living in Kansas City. Uh, I heard it on the jukebox. 
and it it was it was such a beautiful song and a haunting song. Um, it sounded it was something it was something drastically haunting about that. You know, I mean, they would they had a they they cut the second verse out. When I go da, 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 and I go downtown, go to the movies. You know, mm -hmm. they took that out on the single, so I I didn't hear that till later on. But it was something very haunting about that. There's a long time coming, but I know there's a change that's going to come. So, you know, even the guy that I worked for at that time, the owner, I had worked, I worked in this nightclub. It was the top black nightclub uh, at that time. It was, it was still, still wasn't that integrated during that time. And uh, he, he was really not into a lot of music, but he even, it was something about that, that that got to him, you know. So it was very, uh, it was a haunting, very beautiful song, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. But, uh, yeah, yeah, you. It's you know. it's it's a song to a feeling. I mean, you think about it; it's, it's just a feeling right. to that song that's inexplicable. And like Bobby Womack said, it has a it has a ring of death to it. Unfortunately, it has right. a. It just has that to it. But now, um, again, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking to James Gatson. He is an iconic drummer. Um, he has worked with the best, and he's still plugging along, doing big things in the industry. James has told me something um, that I, I found very interesting. Um, even when you could have retired a long time ago, you said you're still getting calls for work. Yeah, I'm correct? still getting calls. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I... I'm not mad about it. I, it's great. I mean, to play with the young, because of the uh, rhythms that I play, the young, the younger generation, they they like that, you know. So that's great for me, you know. I mean, I, you know, because I still love to play, you know. And I, you know, I, now I came out here as a jazz drummer. I couldn't play no, no R and B when I came from Kansas City to Los Angeles. Some friends of mine was on the Dean Martin show and I thought they had made the big time. So they had me to come out here and they were doing pop R and B. They were working the casinos and stuff. I couldn't play their music. So they had to let me go. So man, it was, it took me one good thing about Charles, right? I learned by working in his band, you know, he fired me about five times and, uh, you know, I don't know if we could get somebody else or not. I don't know what was happening, but he just had me to play fours that they called. I did no fields or nothing. And I it made me come all the way down from my jazz thing because the jazz, jazz and R and B are quite different. You know, jazz is a big expression thing. R and B is more of a soulful, uh, danceable groove type, you know, in one in certain ways I'll say it like that. But uh, it, it slowed me down and I had to think about uh, what was happening because I couldn't hear that. I couldn't hear, I couldn't hear uh, R&B stuff. I couldn't hear that music. So it took me about eight months and I started getting into it. But the good thing about it, I was able to establish my own style during that time, you know, I, because I didn't necessarily, uh, it wasn't that I could, could I just, didn't adhere to everything that everybody was playing. Now, so now, James, was, not that it was bad, it was great, you know. Mm -hmm. Wow, but that's I, that, that's very, very impressive, the fact that you've been doing it for so long and still um, having a great name in the industry. But James, I got uh, two questions for you, and then um, I wanna, we're gonna have a little fun. Now, um, first question I wanna ask you, um, what kind of advice would you give someone who's been in the industry or looking to get in the industry and, you know, they want to know if they have the stomach for it or what's the ups and downs of it. What kind of advice would you be able to give someone? Well, learn the business. Whatever you do, learn the business of music. You know, uh, that I didn't do. And I, I lost out on a lot of, uh, lost, lost on a lot of money. Say it like that. A lot of, learn the business of music so you'll know what the business is about in order to get paid, you know, for being in the music industry, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I would, if I was, you know, whatever instrument you're playing or whatever, if you're not playing an instrument, if you're singing, study the old, the old greats, as they call it, the old school, study that, mm 
because that's the realness of the music. That's where you learn how to really get it together and you learn what, what you're all about. You know, I, I, I would do that, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. you got, mm -hmm. and you got to, you got to spend time with your craft. That's right. One thing, you know, you got to really spend time with your craft. Now, now James, um, where can the people who are watching today be able to reach out to you? Um, what's your Facebook handles and things of that sort? What's your email, Dan? G-J-Y-M at AOL.com. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, they can, a lot of people, Facebook, a lot of people contact me from Facebook. But, you know, but Facebook. Not, okay, and how would they be able to contact you through via Facebook? Just put James Gatson, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, Dr. James Gatson. Good. So it's on your monitor, ladies and gentlemen. You can reach out to him there. Now, James, we like to have fun on the Sherrard Show. Um, and when we have talented people like yourself on the show, we'd like to see the, have the fans see what you can do. Are you buying some drums or would you like to sing something? Well, I'm not buying any drums. Um, I guess I'd have to try to sing something. Yes, yes, yes. Off of one of your hits or something... Um, Acapella, that's that what we would love. Yeah. Oh, 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 <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now, what, what was that off of? What were you? What were that you was about just something I did. You know, something. Mm -hmm. You know, just. You know, just. Doodling around. It sounds wonderful. Doodling around. James, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the Sherrod Show today. This is off of our special but segment. But you know, I wish I had time. I could play you something. I have some stuff that you don't have time to hear. No, oh, please do. We, we have time. Go ahead and let me, let's hear some of I have stuff. a song that I wrote. That's about what's happening today. Mm -hmm. You know, let me play it for you. We just lost video. Yeah. Sounds wonderful, James. Did you get to hear sounds... Yeah, I heard it. I heard it. I appreciate that. Is that off of a new album coming out? Yeah, I'm working on my music, yeah. That's a beautiful one that, that you've uh, written and you've produced that song as well, as well as performed on it? Yes, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful, James. Well, I did um, most of the I'm, work on it. Tell us where we can be able to purchase it when it comes out and when is it set to come out? I probably have to go online and, you know, what, what they have to, what they call a CD baby or those different places of that nature because I'm not with the you know not with the label. But but you is know. it coming out before the year is out? Uh, possibly yes, yes, yes. Good. Okay. Well we'll be looking for that. That one, yeah. That we'll definitely be looking for that. That kind of sounds like um what's going on in the world today and um it's almost like an anthem. But it's a beautiful song. What's the title yeah. of it, James? I call. I named it <laughs> twenty thirteen. <laughs> I don't. What's a, what's I don't a, know why I did that. You know, is something you know. pretty significant happened in twenty thirteen in your life? No, I just. I don't know why I did it. Just I, I, <laughs> very abstract. That's nice. Well, James, thank you so much for being a part of the Sherrard Show today. This is an iconic drummer who's been in the industry for many years. This is part of our When Legends Speak. You listen. Uh, James, again, thank you. And thank you for all of you all. Um, this is Sherrard Show. It is brought to you by iHeartRadio, as well as Comcast NBC. Check out your local listings for this episode of the Sherrard Show. And when we, um, on our next episode tomorrow on the Sherrard Show, we are having this special group all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. Mac 4 will be joining us on the Sherrard Show. You don't want to miss that episode. In the meantime, be a blessing to others. That's what God will want you to do. In the next until the next time All we'll right. see you then. James, you take care now. Bye bye. Thank you so much for having me. You do the same. All Very right. welcome.